Well, you just okay. Okay, okay thank you. Um, so I'm really pleased that uh, Chris is able to join us today. The uh, Chris has worked for a long time uh, as in Stroud and now with Environment Agency on Network Management Processes, and uh, has really been a driver at the forefront of a lot of the things that have come along over the years. So, and I know that quite a lot of you and a lot of other people are actively involved in natural flood risk management in its many different forms in your own areas. So um, it should be a really interesting discussion. Uh, Chris, would you like to go and put your presentation? Yeah, I would. Put I would. Your presentation up yourself or we can ask. Uh, Let's see if this works. Yeah. You there see the front screen? Yes, thank you. Okay. Okay. Well, I th yeah, thanks, Paul. Um, it is really nice to be here. Um, I'd forgotten about the other thing that was going on, um, but but there we are. No doubt my son will come down and tell me at about five o'clock. Um, so what, what Paul asked me to, to kind of do a presentation, and I, I asked him whether you'd had others talk on this uh, same topic and, and I believe you have and uh, but what I what I kind of want to do is is um, is provide you with with ways of explaining natural flood management to others that will hopefully make sense to people who are not um, embedded in this stuff um, or who might be struggling to understand how it will all work so it's, it's a bit to tell you about what's going on and the kind of um, my philosophy of natural flood management, but also, you know, hopefully to, to give you a toolbox of, of ways of describing this to farmers and landowners or other people within good action groups or people who, who are in local authorities um, that you struggle to, to kind of communicate what we want with. Um, from natural flood management. So, as Paul said, um, I've, uh, I've I work in the environment agency now. I've been there for just over three years. I'm in a small team within the National Flood Risk Directorate that is particularly focused on advising on nature-based solutions for flood risk or natural flood management. Um, but before that, um, I was based in the trying. I've got to work there we are. Oh, maybe I've gone too far. I was based here in Gloucestershire with um, Stroud District Council and um, spent four years uh, working very closely with the flood action groups in Stroud um, for, for each one of these valleys that you can see on the map. And Stroud was, uh, you know, like everywhere, everywhere is interesting. Um, but I live here, so it's more interesting to me. Um, it's it's a complex pattern of flood risk. We've got um, five valleys, and we have people who flood after the confluence of those valleys. We've got people who flood within those valleys. Um, we've got people who flood from surface water, from the streams, from springs. So, so it's over the years, it's been incredibly hard for the authority. Um, to plan a successful flood risk management strategy for this type of place because they're so complicated and, and rural places, particularly with a pattern of settlement where you've got many properties kind of clustered closely historically around watercourses but dispersed from each other. So, uh, you know, as you move down through, uh, through these valleys, you might have three or four properties at extreme risk, and then another few hundred meters down, there's another three or four properties at extreme risk, and so on as you move down the system. So collectively, many hundreds, um, several thousand properties, but but without any kind of one capital scheme which will do it for everyone. So in many respects, an ideal place to 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 try to make natural flood management happen. Because in some respects, um, it's one of the only flood risk management 
kind of approaches that could possibly provide some way of benefiting everyone through the whole system. And I'll come on to why that might be the okay. case. So this is where I cut my teeth. Uh, I'm working very closely with uh, some of the communities um, and you, I'll describe how I kind of worked with them because I think they, you know, this, this was, it was, it was really important kind of learning for me, um, discovering how to take account of, how to work closely with the people who've been flooded and to the bridge the gap between them and uh, the authorities in, in trying to get some of this stuff on the ground. So what is natural for management and how does it work? And so I promised you I'd give you some tools. I won't be talking about models or evidence or data. Um, natural for management is best thought of really as the managing the hydrology of a whole catchment. So if, if you come across people who are a bit nervous about having the word natural in there because it, it strikes them as a little bit kind of um, ad hoc, the best way of describing it is it's, a, it's about managing the hydrology of the whole catchment. So going to the source and following the water all the way through and attempting to intervene in those flood peaks and high water cycles as they move through the whole catchment, rather than just building a, uh, an intervention or a wall at the point of impact. So if people prefer that way of describing it, that's, that's probably a better way. And, and there are only three real hydrological mechanisms that we can bring to bear um, that we call natural flow management. So the doormat here um, represents the roughness. And if you think about the impact of water flowing over tarmac versus grass, you're getting an idea for how we increase roughness. But think of it on a mega size. Um, so we want to increase the roughness of whole catchments by changing vegetation, putting blockages in the way of water, slowing it down um, and increasing the time it takes for a drop of water to get from the point it hits the ground to the point it reaches the sea. We can increase the losses through evapotranspiration, so the water that's um, being given off as moisture from plants, trees, or we can lose it into the ground. And there are various ways that we can, we can kind of help water to get more into the ground. The word for it is infiltration. And we want to get as much water moving through those parts of the cycle as possible. So when we hear the phrase, catchments are saturated, I'm often sat there listening to that going, no, they're not. Catchments are not saturated. Most of our catchments have got um, elements of compacted ground. So they appear to be saturated, but what's happening is a lot of that water is hitting those places and running off as increased runoff, where it should be going down into the soil. Quite often there is more capacity in those soils, but that's hidden by the whole processes uh, of managing land. So we want to improve that. And then, of course, we've got our old favorite, the empty bath. Um, storing water, we need empty vessels. Um, so ponds and reservoirs and so forth are fine, and it costs a lot of money to engineer a little bit of extra storage. What we want for a kind of a natural approach or a whole catchment approach are empty places for that water to fill up at the right time and then either soak into the ground or be let go after the flood peak is gone. So those are our three mechanisms, generally speaking, roughness, infiltration, interception, and storage. And, and what we're basically trying to achieve, I will apologize, this is the only, only bit of graph or model output, and it's not a model output, this is an output of a pencil that I used to draw a graph. Um, if you imagine the black line, is um, what's happening normally in the river or the stream. What we want is to make the blue line through all the things we do. So we want to reduce the peak flow and spread the flow over a longer time period. And if you have trouble um, communicating that to people, then this 
He is my alternative. And the humble funnel is the best way of uh, conceptualizing and thinking about natural food management. So to me, the funnel represents most of our catchments. We've got this enormously wide area and the water falls into those catchments. It flows over the land, it comes into the streams, it comes into the rivers, and it's forced through these incredibly small openings that we've created for it in our landscape because we live there. Our, the bridges, our walls, the culverts. And if you imagine that uh, most um, of the water has to get through that tiny little aperture without causing spillages and causing flooding. It's very, the, the kind of the odds are stacked against us in some ways. Um, what's the remedy? If you fill up your, your funnel too quickly as you're pouring your cider or your beer into some other vessel, you'll get spillages coming out of the top. Uh, and the remedy is to pour it more slowly through your funnel. And you can get the same volume of water through your funnel, but it takes you a few seconds longer. And if you want a concept, for what we're trying to achieve with a lot of natural flood management, it's that. Now, clearly that really only works for catchments where the mechanism for the flooding is that kind of backing. Um, where you've got fenlands and levels, then we are into a different kind of picture and we are more interested in the amount of water that's gathering in these places. But I would hazard a guess that the vast majority of, of, of flooding and problem flooding we get in places where natural flood management can help remedy that is of this type, um, where you get backing up caused by um, either blockages in the wrong place or forcing too much water through infrastructure that we designed for less because there wasn't as much rainfall around in Victorian times, or so we're told. Maybe they just put up with uh, substandard infrastructure. I'm not sure. Um, so the funnel is one of the best models you have in describing this. Stuff. And the principles that I work to uh, generally are, are these. It's a catchment-wide approach. It's the cumulative benefit of multiple interventions over the whole catchment that will make the difference. Um, in the same way, you don't hear people say, we're going to restore curlews by working on one farm in Devon. You cannot solve flooding by working on one or a single farm. It's, it's not a project. It's a form of land and water course management over the longer term. So it's best to think of it as almost a never ending cycle. Um, it's, it's just something that will continue on uh, and needs to be refined and will need to happen over the long term. It's a bit like farming. We don't, we don't have farming that ends. It's not a project. It's a cycle of production, husbandry, and, and different management techniques. And it's best to think of natural flood management as that rather than a project um, in its own right. And uh, despite what uh, the name might suggest, uh, natural flood management is not leaving everything to go natural. In fact, in many ways, it's more highly interventionist than lots of other techniques uh, because it involves all these uh, uh, significant number of changes over wide areas, um, which takes time and takes a lot of labor and a lot of thinking about. So those are our basic principles. Um, why do people like it? As well as the fact it reduces blood risk, you get all these other things alongside it too. So you get restoration of nature, better habitat, better water quality. Um, we can get carbon stored in our peat bogs and uh, uplands. Um, we get silt slowed down as it's moving through the catchment. Um, and people uh, also like it because um, it's something that's accessible to people um, who wouldn't normally get involved in purpose management to get involved with. And so volunteers and community groups can find themselves involved with the actual implementation of this on the ground 
with all the empowerment and benefits um, that that brings in a way that you can't really get directly involved in a 30 million pound engineering project. You can, you can uh, understand it, you can have your say, but you won't get near the work site, you won't get near the construction. Whereas with natural flood management, um, give or take uh, the odd, the odd um, uh, exception, it's perfectly possible in some situations for people to get involved in this with all the benefits that that brings. So that's why it's popular. It's a way of reducing risk and getting all this other stuff alongside. And, and sometimes people get perplexed by, you know, there seems to be an infinite number of things that you can do for natural flood management. And it's it best to think of it is in this kind of, um, uh, I think of it in four packages of work. So I've broken it down into um, land use changes that restore or uh, create new habitats. And the reason we want those habitats uh, restored or created for our purposes is because they generally increase the roughness of flow routes, they intercept rain better, and they boost evapotranspiration and infiltration. So there's a whole kind of load of these things, and we'll be hearing more about them in the next few years, I suspect. Tree planting, rewilding, peat and restoration, um, scrub establishment, uh, and they may seem disconnected from natural flood management, um, but the mechanism for why we like them is because they increase roughness, generally speaking, and they increase infiltration and interception of rainfall. But that's our kind of first package of stuff that, that, that you can think of. The next is best just thought of as farming. So it's changes to farming practice um, and husbandry of soils, livestock and crops uh, in slightly different ways that will increase infiltration again. So more water soaking into the ground, less compaction, roughness um, through vegetation. So not even soils bare or changes to grazing regimes um, that lead to rougher, rougher grasses and longer swords of grasses. Um, most natural for management at the moment avoids this type of work because it's difficult. Um, and flood money is very hard to use to pay for different land management techniques um, because the changes to land management are over such a wide area. It's very difficult to demonstrate those, those um, uh, positive effects to flood risk. But we know that runoff management, soil erosion, and compaction, um, and roughness are key mechanisms in the landscape. Just at the minute, um, EA and need local flood authorities and others generally are not involved in this type of work. Um, but I'll, I'll kind of say a bit more about that uh, towards the end because that's that is changing. So that's the sort of second package of stuff. Um, that's a bit about this soil strategy. There is actually a, a soil strategy for England uh, that was released in 2019. Um, that's worth digging out if people want something to, to read to see what the, um, what, what the uh, intended better management of soils is meant to be. Um, but the third package of stuff is this. This is what most people are calling natural flood management. And this is kind of 90% of current natural flood management is of this time. So it's these minor capital works that produce these small changes in topography or landscape. That, uh, that can be really effective at changing those hydrologies. So they're slowing flows, um, pushing water out of channels and doing all sorts of other kind of jobs. And they're very popular, um, partly because once you've got uh, a good system going and you've got a bit of experience, they're quite easy to do. Um, and they're usually acceptable to farmers and landowners because what you'll notice is there's not a lot of farming going on in the places where these things are generally built. Uh, the, the kind of marginal land, stream sides, rough areas, and, and it's relatively easy to relatively to justify funding this stuff from flood funding, um, given the right sort of evidence. So this is what the vast majority of people call natural flood management. But it's really important not to forget the other two. The habitats, 
and the changes to farming. And the sort of the fourth thing are these kind of larger scale changes. So, so these are kind of semi-engineered, let's call them, uh, or natural fund management max, some other people call them. So these are larger capital projects that do things that look like natural fund management. So floodplain reconnections, um, taking down embankments, creating larger storage areas. And they are, but they need some expert planning and design to make them work, largely because we're often de-engineering the landscape to do this. Um, or de-engineering and then re-engineering in a different way to encourage more water onto the landscape. So I tend to think of natural flood management as falling into those four types. And, and the, the, one of the benefits of thinking of it like that is that you start to understand the different funding mechanisms and the different institutional frameworks around those types of activity. And you start to unlock and unpick some of the barriers that people come around across when they're thinking, we want to do some natural flood management, um, but the type you want to do and where you want to do it is really important to understand how you're going to fund it. Um, so hopefully that's, that's a kind of a, a, a nicer, more straightforward way of taking out some of the complexity. And if you think about those underpinning, um, slowing the roughness, infiltration, and storage and combine it with these things, then you know you can start to talk the language of expert natural flood managers uh, if you want to. So we're generally, I mean, this, you know, there's other ways of thinking of this. People have started to kind of think about these in different ways. Um, you can think about kind of environmental engineering, there's other, you know, these kind of bigger things, all this headwater stuff, but that's that's quite confusing. I want I won't kind of go into much uh, more detail on that. So there's a, there's a few kind of basic principles, again, that I think it's important to do. And that, and that is, um, you know, concentrate. If you're thinking, oh, we want to do some, where can I do it? Think about concentrating on land. So going to the source of the water and largely in ordinary water courses. Um, so in effect, those kind of smaller streams and ditches. Um, institutionally, those are managed by either local flood authorities or term friendly ports, but also hydrologically, those are the places that you should be aiming for. Um, <clears throat> so there's, I think, the, the rough breakdown of percentage. If you think of main river versus ordinary watercourse, broadly speaking, um, it's a 20 80 percent split. So of the mapped watercourses in the country, 20% are main river, so bigger rivers, um, where flood risk is managed by the water agency, and 80% are ordinary watercourses for these smaller streams. And that makes sense, of course, because you've got far more tributaries flowing down into the main river. And it's those tributaries that we should be targeting for work. And another principle there, which I think I've said before, is this kind of building small and many not few and large, it's really tempting <clears throat> to try to do something massive. Let's get a big storage area, let's do a massive thing. And, and those are good strategies for reducing flood risk, but they're best left to, to engineers and flood risk managers. Um, aiming smaller means that the stuff we're putting in is safer, there's less risk involved, it's cheaper, and more people can get involved who are not technical experts. Um, it's really important, obviously, I guess this kind of goes without saying, to, to work directly with the landowners and the farmers and um, get out and start talking to the people who understand how to and how water is moving across their land. You, you, can, you can get a lot of information from aerial photography, from maps, um, but some of the richest source of information is just talking to farmers and landowners about how they um, perceive waters moving through the landscape. Um, and, and then use that information and compare it to the stuff you're getting from surface flow maps. So the, you know, some of the, when I worked in Stroud, we didn't have um, hydrological models. 
um, the best stuff we used to look at where water is moving through the landscape are the surface water flooding maps, which are just available on Google. And if you put your postcode in for the postcode of the farm um, and you ask it to show you the surface water flooding, it will generally show you the pathways that water is taking over land through that landscape. And those are the places that we want to be aiming some of these interventions. So you can kind of corroborate what you learn from farmers and landowners, what's coming out of some of the, uh, the technical data and help to help to kind of bring together a good uh, level of knowledge about what's happening within the country. Um, it's, you know, I went through those four packages of, of, of broad work, and it, it's really important to, to say that clearly the landowner or the farmer has to be content and happy with whatever's been uh, suggested. And so there's a, a lot of this, um, is about compromise and working with farmers to understand how um, what you want to do would fit within their farm business because um, it needs to be compatible. And um, especially if, if, you know, if we're trying to do this stuff uh, as community groups or as part of kind of um, voluntary work or as part of uh, working with environmental organizations. Um, generally, you can't pay the farmers to do this stuff. So it has to fit within their, their kind of existing farm business. And they really are kind of crucial, um, uh, as well as providing the land, uh, farmers, uh, tenant farmers, landowners, uh, and contractors um, should be uh, a fundamental part of the workforce for building and doing that. So in Stroud, the model we used um, quite often was to offer the farmer or the landowner the, the contract to actually build the natural for management themselves, um, or to use their kind of traditional contractor. And then I would work with them to, to help them get, the, get that right. So there was a, a sort of technical oversight from me, but they provided the, the labor of the workforce. And, um, and that brings all sorts of benefits as well, because they then feel some sort of ownership of the work. Clearly it's on their land, so they, they do own it. But, but I mean a kind of um, uh, you know, an attachment to the work, they've understood why it's been built, why it's needed, and it provides that connection to communities downstream or amongst them who are, who are part of, the, who, are, who are kind of at flood risk or have been flood. So, you know, in the same way that community groups, financial groups, and others feel energized and empowered by involvement in this stuff, um, in my experience, farmers and landowners also feel energized and empowered by doing it themselves as part of this process. And not all will want to do it, and not all farmers and landowners will say yes, but you know, this is the kind of um, a preferable route to. to to, to achieving that stuff. And the, the contractors are, are really key to this as well. And you know, if you start to unpick, the, they'll look closely at this kind of ecosystem of agricultural contractors and woodland managers, ground workers, fencers. You know, there's a whole system of rural employment out there. And so creating skills and capacity in that existing network to do natural formation is an important part of this. If, if we use volunteers to do all of it and put these guys on the left out of business, then no one will thank us and we won't be uh, contributing to the kind of wider rural economy at the same time. So it, I think it's important to get a balance between using environmental NGOs, volunteers, but also just um, training and building capacity by letting contracts basically to the existing rural contractors workforce. Um, and if you think about the kind of benefits for that, as, you know, as, as well as just the employment benefits, these guys are often only spending less than 1% of their time on your project and 99% of their time doing other projects for the farmers and landowners. And if they enjoy natural management and they understand it, 
they can start to evangelize and be an advocate for it when they're talking to other parents and landlords and just doing simple stuff. Um, so loads of good reasons to, to work uh, with those type of people. And then what about the people having the NFM done to them? Um, so these are generally people who've been flooded, um, wider community, businesses, residents who have been flooded in the past or are at risk of flooding. And, and you know, I, I don't think it's a bit of a kind of cliche, and I don't think we can overstate it though, that you can't go about this kind of catchment wide flood management approach without involving the wider catchment of people, which is generally, you know, the councils, the parish councils, the, the local businesses, um, and the, the flood groups and the residents who are all part of that kind of local network of decision making and democracy. So, so whereas I guess you can bring a big capital scheme in and you can talk to the people in charge and then you've got your construction site. Um, I think natural flood management needs long term sustained from partnerships. Um, otherwise, it falls on because if if people don't trust the work or they're not bought into it, then you, know, you can you can probably carry it through with the force of an individual for a, a year or two, but then nothing else will happen after that. So it needs to be built as part of a, a wider community approach, and particularly getting local councillors on board, irrespective of the politics. Obviously, I think it's really good sense to 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 make natural flood management the kind of common sense approach for all stripes of political belief because you know it's not it's not it shouldn't be involved in that kind of local politics um, or politics with a big p so bringing the local councils and parish councillors into the discussions i think is a very important part of, um, of successful approaching natural flood management and and you know there, there's if i'm talking to uh, authorities and others then um, I include this slide because if you're going to work with communities, then you, you some of this stuff just needs stating. You know, um, it, the group should be involved in some of the project development. Uh, where I worked in Stroud, the chair of one of the production groups was on the interview panel that appointed me to the project, uh, along with the officer of the council and someone from the department agency. And um, you know, seems like a simple step, but it meant that that person felt involved in the decision-making from the very start of, of, kind of my role. And, and I think that helped build relationships from what had previously been fairly patchy relationships between the authorities and the footprints in our area. It means evening meetings uh, and weekend meetings. So, so you know, um, there's nothing new about this to most people in this call, I imagine, but it just needs stating that you, if you're going to work with communities and others, you can't just do it as a nine to five job. It's, it's got to fit around the convenience of the people that you're working with. Um, and involving the groups in some of the decision making and taking the groups out on site to see the work. And as I've already said, as part of volunteer work is, is really a, a crucial part of the whole system. Um, these are some photographs of the Stroud Club groups doing that very thing, uh, visiting sites, getting involved and talking to some of the contractors that are doing the work for them. So a bit of a, bit of a cheesy slide. Uh, Paul might have seen this before, but I, you know, it, it again, goes without um, saying these strong relationships. People often would say to me, what's the best natural food management thing you've ever built? And it's this, it, it is relationships that make good natural food management. Um, you can have as many leaky dams or as many earth bones as you like, but if you can't sustain a relationship between community authorities and landowners, then the project will dry up and you know, it won't carry forward and succeed. So the lessons I learned um, from, from our approach were compromise. The, you, know, you, can't, you can't have the perfect optimum blood uh, reducing structure everywhere. You've got to compromise. And sometimes 
build second best if that's what the farmer or the landowner wants. And getting yourself into a, a mental space where you accept, oh, I could have done something massive there, but it wasn't going to fit, is, a re is really important, uh, partly for the mental health of the person who's running the project. So compromise um, with partners, compromise with landowners, and making sure that you get something done and build a relationship that will allow other stuff to be done in the future. And building and designing interventions that require little or no maintenance. It is, a lot of people get very stressed about the maintenance and the future management of NFM. And on the one hand, I, you know, I'm fully on board with, with, with that. We do need to think about how it will be managed in the future. On the other hand, I'd say, you know, when someone puts a shed up in the countryside or a fence, they haven't always got an investment strategy for the next 20 years about how that will be maintained and looked after. So maybe it shouldn't be quite at the forefront of our thinking, but it is also perfectly possible with some, with some good design and some good thinking to build measures that are passive and require little or no maintenance. Um, and if there's a choice, then that's the way to kind of do things. So, you know, the, what I'm talking about is avoiding head walls and pipes. Pipes always cause blockages. The, the, the old drainage officer, Chris Brower, said to me, pipes cause more flooding than water. It's perfectly true. But, you know, building head walls and pipes in the countryside, you're, you're asking for failure because those things will just jam up. They won't get looked after. There will be maintenance and someone's got to. Whereas if you've got passive overflow, you might get a bit of erosion, but very straightforward to repair in the future. So there are, there are examples of ways of doing things that are more passive and less engineering. Um, building small and many, not few and large, covered that already and starting as far upstream as possible. Um, where possible on land, where the rain hits the land is the first point you want to be thinking about intervening. And and if projects are getting going, this kind of trying to solve everything in the first few years will, will cause lots of stress. It's focusing on these kind of low risk certain wins, particularly if the farmers and landowners are new to this stuff. But you know, building confidence um, is, is important. And you're going to build more confidence by doing something small and easy, which then leads you to better things in a few years' time than if you try to do something big and impressive and it falls over within a couple of years. So those are the kind of basic principles. I just wanted to kind of spend a few slides telling you what's going on um, in government and the environment agency to, to try to make more natural development happen. So we've just got to the end of the, the kind of government-funded £15 million pound programme. Um, which ended in April. Um, and, and, you know, there is a kind of what's happening next uh, question. And there's a few things here. So I worked with the team that were drafting the new national flood strategy. And um, if people are looking there, you'll see that nature-based solutions and natural flood management form a much more central part of the national flood and coast risk management strategy than they would have done in the previous versions or the previous version that's gone past. Um, and working with farmers and landowners is also a central part of the strategy as well. There's lots of other things in there, but, but natural flood management, uh, working with farmers and landowners are on an equal footing with all this other stuff. It's not something that's nice to do if you've got some spare time. So it's sat there in the strategy. Um, a colleague of mine has been working uh, with the kind of government digital team to set up um, a basic space for natural flood management and .gov.uk. That's now available. So if you go to .gov.uk and put natural flood management in there, you'll see it, it, it seems very basic, but it's a bit of a kind of um, introduction and some signposting. Um, and it's as much for other legal local flood authorities maybe as it is for community groups and for residents. So some basic information and natural flood management has now kind of got its own space on Dr. I'm working very um, closely with people in DEFRA and other colleagues to build 
natural food management into the government's new agricultural policy framework. So in effect, that means you know, the, the, the subsidies, the payments for farmers are shifting from kind of being governed by common agricultural policy into domestic policy, so the agriculture. And payments are moving from basic payment system, which was a payment per, um, per hectare of land, to payments for public goods. So building blood risk reduction as one of the public goods into those new schemes is a, is a, is a, is a priority for, for the Environment Agency, and it's also a priority for government. So there was launched the other day some new funding for um, farmers and landowners in protected landscapes. Um, and this was this is funding that's kind of designed to, to be a transitional fund from as, as farmers and, and landowners and others move from the kind of um, common agricultural policy into the new system, this kind of period of uncertainty and transition that people will have heard about in the news and things. Um, and that what the government are doing is trying to kind of soften some of that with more, more funding, uh, bespoke funding. And there's a new fund for protected landscapes. So that's areas of outstanding beauty and protected uh, national parks. And uh, one of the funded outcomes is further flood risk reduction in natural food management. So that's available now. It was only launched the other day. Um, there are an existing scheme called catchment sensitive farming, um, which has been around for a while, focused on water quality. Um, that's now being expanded to include natural flood management within its remit from April 2022. So I'm working closely with Natural England to, to kind of make that happen. And then the big prize is the, the main agricultural payments system um, is shifting to these environmental and management schemes and building natural flood management as a core part of what farmers and landowners will be incentivized and funded to do is quite a large task. But that's that's what we're about at the minute. And the, the schemes will kind of, I won't go into much detail, the schemes are sort of, there are three of them and each will kind of play a different part. So there's a scheme at the top there called sustainable farming incentive. And that's more about managing soils, reducing compaction, some of these kind of bigger widespread things that, that flood money finds it really hard to do, as I explained. Um, so soil management, managing basic cropping, making sure soils are not fair, um, trying to um, change uh, what we would call risky management. Um, so if you've got steep slopes, rather than working the soils, um, shifting them over to permanent pasture. Um, so, and then this th the second scheme, local natural recovery, which we can pick up a lot of these kind of smaller scale capital interventions, but importantly pay for their management and maintenance at the same time. And then landscape recovery, uh, which is aimed at this kind of bigger restoration of nature. Um, so some of the things I talked about in that kind of first package, rewilding, peatland restoration and woodland creation. So lots of stuff going on and, and trying to make sure some of this happens in a way and in places which will reduce flood risk is a big part of what um, I'm involved in and what we're trying to achieve as this kind of mainstreaming, is the buzzword, mainstreaming natural food management into different areas of, of government policy. So I'll leave you um, with thoughts of a um, friend of mine. I mean, if, if I were to summarize natural food management, I. You know, I still think it's one of the most exciting uh, kind of environmental um, pursuits available to us. It's, it's, it's kind of a, you know, a Goldilocks thing where you've got huge benefits that are measurable to people and all of this potential uh, benefit to nature, to the environment. Uh, and there's some fantastic stories to tell. And um, this is a friend of mine who is a poet from Stroud, and he was embedded, an embedded poet with um, the farming or farming network called the Pasture Fed Livestock Association. And he was there as 
is produces anthology of poems. And the last stanza there of this says, there's too much fact runs off busy people like water from compacted soil. Learn how to open them to the seeds of ideas, water them with stories and watch them flow. And, and I think, you know, the more people telling the story of natural flood management in ways that are accessible and in ways that are not exclusive or complex, um, will hopefully encourage far greater level of implementation. And kind of, you know, this is my attempt to demystify uh, some of the, the mythology and the complexity that, that might have grown up around natural flood management um, in the past. There we are. Thank you, Chris. That was wonderful. Uh, really lovely and some really interesting perspectives on um, natural flood risk management, I suppose. It's, I was really pleased that you focused on relationships um, as being the core element of both natural flood risk management and many other things actually as well, and the importance of setting up those relationships and, and building them. Um, and the other point that I particularly welcome is um, actually the consideration that you start with the art of the possible um, rather than the art of uh, what might be possible sometime in the future. Um, because the perfect, don't let the perfect be the destroyer of the good. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> so uh, really, really important. I do remember being involved with some very, very early arable reversion, sorry, arable measures with, on farms and I remember going back to when the we piloted arable measures on farms um, and went back to some of the original people we talked to I was expecting them to uh, throw them out with the bath water um, but they'd all each of them had been on a journey and when we went back to speak to them they were all very very positive and that meant that all of the the whole batch of things like um, field margins and beetle banks and um, uh, uh, skylight patches and things like that were introduced for the first time. And it was because those people, we'd had relationships with those farmers that had built up over the years and that then shaped the whole policy, uh, national policy and what it's become with countryside stewardship and all the rest. Um, so rebuilding relationships and thinking about doing things in the long term is really important. Anyway, that's enough of me. Um, have, has anybody got any questions? If you want to raise your hand, but um, before I ask Linda and one or two others, do we want to uh, get rid of the presentation, Chris? Yeah. And then I can yeah. scan across and see who's, who's got there their hand. Go. Linda, do you want to start? And then I, if people want to put up their hands or raise their hands and so on. We'll go to Linda, then Anthony, and uh, move on from there. Uh, I'd like to ask a question about the uh, practices for planting and ploughing. I've just been told recently that the modern methods make the drainage worse. That's, you know, the problem here is we get a lot of runoff from the fields. Is that correct? I don't know anything about farming. So you were talking about it being difficult to influence what farmers do because they can't be funded. But... Can you t say something about that? Is that a new thing or is modern? I mean, does that mean the last 20 years? Can you help uh, what, me? I, I think what, I mean, people, people have become obsessed about ploughing. And I often hear people say, we need to plough in a different direction. But if you think about it, a, a ploughed field is only ploughed in that direction for a few days a year. You know, it's not, it's not a big part of, of the year. What, what people are talking about, I think, is what's called minimum or zero tillage farming. So it's where every time, every time you plough and harrow the land and prepare it for, for uh, seed, um, when you turn it, you're, you're releasing methane and carbon dioxide into the atmosphere because you're, you're encouraging the, the animals that live in the, and the fungi that live in the soil to to consume the organic matter. So people are trying to encourage to, um, uh, farming techniques that involve less turning the soil and exposing it to the air 
because we're losing a lot of carbon dioxide. Um, and it's, you know, we're, we're contributing to climate change by doing that. Now, also, when that happens, when, if you, if you kind of, you know, if you work the land well at the right time of year, then ploughing and harrowing um, and preparing for seed will help water to infiltrate into the ground at the point where it's all, you know, there's a nice rough um, or a, a good seed bed. But if you do it at the wrong time of year, you end up successively over years encouraging this compaction at a, at a level, it might not be on the surface, but just maybe a, a foot or so under the surface, you can get this compaction at the level at which the plough is always operating. And so you minimum tillage or zero tillage is basically farming without plowing, plowing and harrowing the land. Now, it often involves the use of Roundup or glyphosate, because if you think after the growing year, you want to get rid of what's there because you need to start again. So the trade-off um, for zero tillage or minimum tillage is uh, increased use of some herbicide that clears the existing vegetation. So, so that's one thing that you know people consider. Um, and sometimes uh, minimum or zero tillage creates some, um, it looks like it's got superficial surface compaction because it's not being broken up. Yeah. And I think it, it can, you know, you can get some runoff, but I think the key thing is people are forgetting that the serious compaction is generally the stuff that's subsurface. And over time, reducing the number of times the soil is turned over and worked at the same depth reduces that compaction because you're, you're basically letting the soil live again and all the fungi and bacteria and microorganisms in there and the worms start to break it up. So it can look superficially worse, but from, an, from a water point of view, generally, um, you know, I say generally because everything's so site-specific on timing, generally those tillage practices that people consider modern are better for runoff because they're, they're reducing compaction. Okay. And they're also reducing carbon emissions. But the trade-off is they often involve the use of Roundup or something that, that is instead of the plow, because you want to get rid of the vegetation, the end, the end of the vegetation from last year's crop to plant a new crop. So it isn't, that isn't really accurate. What, what I've been told that, that less tillage isn't making flooding no, worse. It's not okay. accurate. Thank you. There are a whole load of other. I mean, I could I could go on to this one for ages. Yeah. Um, You're probably wincing but, as I talked there, Paul, trying to. Uh, there are a whole load of other things around there as well. To things like field drain management, the mm. management of ditches, the um, the fact that a lot of the drainage and ditch work was put in when labour was cheap, and the farms were smaller. And nowadays we don't have lots of people running around the land. They people are busy in winter. And so the whole issues about, well, what does, you know, is the drainage system, are the drainage systems on farms maintainable in, in the modern landscape? And if not, how do they need to be changed? And how do we make that happen? And so on and so on and so on. So there's all sorts of issues as well. But I'm going, I could go on for ages, but Anthony, you had a question. Hi there. Thank you very much, Chris, for a most uh, excellent uh, presentation. It's extremely useful. Um, I'm in Wellsbourne, a village in South Warwickshire on the River Dean, which goes into the Avon, just upstream of Stratford. We're hoping to do some NFM measures upstream and indeed quite a long way upstream in our um, uh, watershed area and uh, so on. So a more detailed question, two parts. Firstly, where should we be thinking of putting leaky dams and where should we be thinking of putting ponds and buns and things like that? And secondly, and perhaps more importantly, how to choose the site for leaky dams um, I realise if we make it in an area where it's too shallow, then the water will probably go around the sides of our dam and it, as if it wasn't there. And if it's in a deep, then it will only hold back five or ten cubic metres and then it would overtop. But I want to get a little bit more of a handle on how to choose it. We're 
to try and get hold of some professional management, probably using yeah. Chipston, who are near us as people to advise. But I just want to um, probe your <laughs> bit knowledge as to where do we put the damn things? <laughs> Being a deliberate Any, I'm tempted to say anywhere, any, anywhere that there is a farmer who will let you put them, Anthony, but that's not the yes. right answer, probably. No, um, but it's a very, it's a useful answer, yes. So, so we, we did, we did produce, uh, it, it's on the uh, catchment based approach website. So we, I, I kind of worked on uh, what we call a risk assessment for leaky woody structures. And it's, it's published on the catchment based approach website. I'm sure Paul will, will send a, a link to it. Um, and what that, so, so there are, there are lots of considerations Anthony, and there's no general rule of thumb. However, you should be avoiding, in your head, think uh, we don't want to be building leaky woody structures on any stream, which is probably over three meters wide. So you need to be thinking about small streams. Yep. Um, you need to be thinking what will happen to the water that's attenuated or go around the sides. Now, small amounts of attenuation are not a problem. One of the misconceptions about leaky woody structures is that it is all about storage. It is not all about storage. It is primarily a method for increasing the roughness of the system. So the actual storage volume behind an individual structure is almost immaterial. What you're looking for is the cumulative effect of all the small amounts of attenuation, but more importantly, the increasing roughness of that system. So, so you want to be... But if it, if it doesn't store and it just hits a leaky dam, um, and okay, some goes through the dam, some goes over the top, some goes around the sides, over a period of, say, five minutes, all the water that's arrived will then still have gone through because it, you've... It, your, it could, it could well have done, but then you need... But you need so, so often I see structures, you know, People have not put enough structures in, so you need lots of them. Um, yeah, we're expecting somewhere between 600 and 1,000 to be... To okay. So all, all, if you think all the water going around the sides, at the time it's going around the side, it's also then going into the ground because there's, you're forcing that water onto the bank and hopefully the vegetation on the bank is much rougher. If you think of the channel as being a smooth pipe, and the, the bank as being the doormat. It's not just the fact that you're storing that water and then it's all filled up in a few minutes and it's gone. Um, it's also that the water is being pushed around the side and it's got to go through that rougher landscape. Also, the infiltration rates on the banks will generally be a lot higher for obvious reasons than they are in a channel. So you're still losing water and you're still slowing water. So the basic principle will be around um, doing lots of smaller ones, which is safe, but extending them onto the floodplain if possible. Uh, but safety is one of the key factors, Anthony. So, so the risk assessment will, hopefully it's fairly user-friendly, will help you to understand the types of structures and the sizes that are going to be safe in the landscapes you're working with. I mean, there's there's all sorts of different different ways of building things and different systems and you know different decisions that will go into the kind of uh, should I do it here or there that are far too detailed to go into now. And, I, but, I, and I've seen some of these things already, but I just wanted to probe your mind in particular. But yes, hopefully that was helpful. I mean, I can't the where to put them in the landscape um, should be influenced by safety and risk as well. But if you're trying to maximise the benefits from them, then, then you know, going for a uh, shallow gradient where, air, where water can spread is clearly a more effective approach than steeper areas uh, where they, you know, the amount of water that will be pushed out onto the side will be reduced. Yeah. I, I Those do, are all broad principles, Anthony. There's a lot I, I, of do, I do take the, the, the pressure drop and roughness factors because in my professional life, I was <laughs> designing pipe work and pressure drops down pipes. Oh, well, there you are then. Which isn't quite the same as the, 
Yes, exactly. Um, <laughs> at the same time, I was thinking of them tending to be more as impervious pipes rather than as pipes that will actually absorb some of the water or whatever that's going through them, which is what the case is here. Thank, <laughs> Thank you very you. much. Thank okay. you, Anthony. Thank you, Chris. Um, has anybody else got a question? Bill. Followed by Julie. Thank you. Um, yeah, Chris. Um, interesting to know about your sort of insider view of the Environment Agency now that you're there, in particular as regards funding for NFM. Um, funding for flood alleviation has long been calculated on number of properties that with potential to be protected or alleviated from flooding and so on that's really difficult with natural flood management because it's it's a much the outcomes are much less um right. prescribed yeah. in a way um is there any movement that you're aware of within environment agency to take account of that and say you know we might have a completely different picture in the way that we alleviate flooding or reduce peaks or whatever and therefore it is worth funding but not in the same way as the big flood alleviation schemes. Yeah, that, it, 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 you're right. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very high bar to use. And what I was trying to show when I went through my kind of four types is some of the rationale for why it is very hard sometimes to use flood money to do the type of activity that, that people want to do. And I, I, get, I did give the impression it was easier to use flood money for the kind of leaky dams and things. And I know it's generally not, it's still really hard to use flood grant and aid because of this technical difficulty in demonstrating this cumulative benefit from a dispersed system. So, so there are things going on. Now, the, the funding formula changed um, about six months ago. I've, I've lost, I think, like a lot of people, I've lost track of time, but the funding formula was changed slightly. And what, what two changes were particularly kind of important? Now, it, it won't unlock vast quantities of extra cash for natural flood management, but there was the introduction of a new risk band. So previously, you had to demonstrate that um, you know, your interventions would take you from uh, either the jump was from the 1 in 30 to 1 in 100, and there's now a new band in between, which is a 1 in 30 to 1 in 50. And that, to me, was um, a very interesting uh, amendment because you, you know, lots of natural flood management, it's very difficult to demonstrate that one in a hundred year benefit, but it could be, you know, this is with that one in the 50 is within the ballpark of the stuff that I'm confident we could intervene in, um, given the right type of intervention and the right intensity. <coughs> So there's the introduction of the, the interim ban, and there was a new payment rate for what are called the environmental outcomes. Now, the environmental outcomes could include approaches to reducing flood risk that also generate some of these other benefits like nature recovery or habitat improvement. So leaky woody structures or you know, other things that have multiple benefits become more straightforward to fund if they're included within the overall scheme, because they're also providing some of these other environmental benefits. Um, the modeling that will allow people to link some work to reduction still needs work. And, but there is, you know, I think people in the environment agency are very aware that the, the current modeling um, isn't, good enough to allow the, the kind of the flood funding to be unlocked. So there's work going on on the modeling. Um, I'm, one of the reasons I'm putting lots of emphasis on things like the environmental management scheme and catchment sensitive farming is of course, because um, those will be funded through different funding mechanisms, but could unlock lots of other natural flood management without the need to go through the flood granting aid route. So doesn't quite answer your question, Bill, um, completely, because I, you know, 
it, it won't be easier to fund non-flood outcomes using flood money. You still have to generate the evidence, but there are lots of other funding routes becoming available because this the system for, for paying farmers is shifting from the basic payment system to payment for public goods. And so reduction in flood risk is a recognised public good, it's sat there on the basis of the Agriculture Act, and I'm making it my business to ensure that, that it's, a, it's a really um, core part of what farmers will be paid to do. So two approaches, tweaking the formulas has happened, and there might be more tweaks, but making sure this other big funding um, and the budgets for paying for public goods will contribute to natural flood management uh, in a substantial way. Okay, that's great, Chris, thank you. Uh, thanks, Chris. There's a couple of other things, I think, as well, which is one, the latest consultation that um, we did respond to, which on uh, the use of FDGIA, that's the partnership funding stuff. Mm. It have a whole question around funding of natural flood risk management. We put something in on that. And the other one is that the there is a project out at the moment on creating new indicators for um, a success of flood risk management, if you like. And that's being linked to the 25 projects that have gone ahead through the um, Resilience and Innovation Fund, the Environment Agency's Resilience and Innovation Fund. That's and right, yeah. That project is just kicking off. I've got a meeting, I think it's next week, I've got a meeting on that. And what we're going to- There gonna... are eight, eight of those projects, aren't there, Paul, which are, which are specifically going to be doing quite a lot of that for the management. Yes, there's eight of those, but what I'm really interested in is not just on the natural flood risk, getting indicators on the natural flood risk management bit, but on more of the people dimensions, more of the people aspects of um, uh, flood risk management. I was, on, I was on a call earlier today and an engineer said, I started off my career thinking that um, flooding was all about the water and now I realize it's all about the people. And um, that's where we need to focus our attention uh, on getting the indicators right, better indicators, so that when we have, whether it's FDGIA funding or measures going back to government or whatever it happens to be, uh, we, we get the focus of attention right on um, you know, what is this all about. Um, so natural flood risk management will have one bit of that. We're involved with four of those Resilience and Innovation Fund projects, and we are involved with the um, we are involved with this multiple indicators project as well, um, and that's what we're going to be trying to do. So, Julie, did you have a question? I saw your hand waving up. Um, yes, please. Um, hello, Chris. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. Now, as everyone else knows, because I've told everyone a million times. Um, we're in a steep-sided valley, which has been generally, uh, or basically, a man-made flood risk. So all this talk of farmers' fields, we don't have farmers' fields. We haven't really got the space. We're sort of Surrey uh, coming into London Borough of Croydon. So is there, um, we have got some space, but obviously the developers are now just mad hell-bent on developing on it. Um, so have you got, let's say, a package? Because we won't be the only catchment like this in the country. Yes, there's going to be lots where farmers can help with the flood management, but there might be lots of areas like ours. So is there a booklet or a package or something to say, this is what you do in a suburban area to manage to, for flood risk management? So you've got a steep sided catchment, but it's full of, it's, it's all developed, basically. Yeah. It's- No, not all of it. We have got, we've got some trees left. Not a lot, because the way yeah. the way the Croydon work, if there's, if there's room for a tree, there's room for six flats. Okay. <laughs> um, I mean, you're, it, it's it's related, but slightly different. So you're you're into the, you know sounds like you're much more into the business of of suds. Depends whether you're uh, surface yeah. flooding or or it's from a stream that's just coming through the whole system. We're on clay. You're on clay. Well, still, st you know, clay doesn't mean the suds don't work or natural flood management. It means you need to change what you do 
So you can make it work in impermeable places, but it, it, it changes the interventions that you would be thinking about putting in place. I, I don't know if there, there isn't, frustratingly, a single place to go to, to to get the booklet on how to do it for your circumstance, I'm afraid. There's a gap in the market there, Paul. <laughs> yeah. um, there are, you know, there are, there are lots of places, I guess, like, like, like yours, where it's not particularly rural. There are, there are you know, the developments over time, particularly, I guess, before there were any drainage rules which stopped people linking things directly to the water course or to a surface system or the sewer, uh, whatever it is that generated the risk, were enforced or in place. And so over time, this, the water courses can't cope with all the additional runoff. And um, yeah, I, I don't know what the answer is, I'm afraid, Judy. It's, um, you know, I don't know the circumstances. I mean, there's, there's, there are some, some um, water companies are doing or trialing retrofitting of, of so taking all the downpipes and the gutters out of the surface flow system and trying to delay them. So, you know, you can, you can, when I say suds, I don't, I'm not particularly meaning the stuff that's built onto the new supermarket, although that will be important. I'm talking about the retrofitting. So going to houses that have been there for 20, 30 years and back designing, changing the way the drainage works on them. But it's for obvious reasons, it's hard to do that because you're dealing with thousands of individual homeowners and thousands of individual properties and plumbers and builders who over years have kind of taken an easy route and connected things up badly. And unpicking it and unstitching it all is, is, is very hard. So, yeah, I'm not being much help, I'm afraid, Julie. It's, um... Um, no, no, you, you, you have. Um, so we have got a scheme for retrofit. And at the moment, in the next two weeks, we're having surveys with PFR for okay. 250 properties. Yeah. But obviously, as we all know, PFR is it's not the, the silver bullet. Then we, we, we then hope to run schemes in parallel. So that the PFR that we install now isn't overtopped in ten years. Yeah. Um, so there are we are looking at schemes where we'd be retrofitting um, water butts on down pipes. Yeah. To get yeah. the surface water out. Um, so so yeah, there there are lots of things. But is is there any project then where the EA will be will be investigating this scenario? At, there was a woman on the chat actually called Amanda McDermott who works for Solar Flow and they've. They're, they're doing loads of work on rain gardens. She just left to go and watch the football. I just saw her, her thing come up on the chat. So they're doing quite a lot of work with this idea called rain gardens. So kind of going beyond water butts to having other things in people's gardens that take up a lot more of the water. So it might be worth having a look at their, their website to get more ideas. Um, I have to, I'm not, you know, I'm not really a specialist, I have to confess, at the, at the kind of suds, urban stuff. It's not really my kind of um, forte, I'm afraid. Really. I understand how it works, but I, I don't know. I don't know the full suite of what you can do, how, how to get around all the systems and how to get the funding working and things like that. I mean, we, we, we've got we've got funding. We've we've gone through the OB uh, outline business case, so we've, yeah. we've we've got the funding. Sounds like we you're just, on the case for quite a lot of it, then. <laughs> yeah, we just don't know don't know how. So we, yeah, we've we've looked at greening the streets and the rain gardens, um, but it, it's just looking for any angle, just like a death by a thousand cuts. Get bit out here, bit out here of the, of the rain. I mean, um, I guess I guess you want you know you need to be maximising any bit of green space you've got needs to be maximised so it can it can act as a kind of dual purpose. So doing its function of a park or whatever it is, but also mm. storing water and increasing infiltration and even roadsides. And there's something, you know, there's a lot of work on road development and adding planting into roads. The trouble is mm. it's all expensive stuff because you've got to, you're digging up existing infrastructure and changing it. So, so, it's very effective, 
But to be effective at scale, you need lots of it in the same way yeah. with, you do with natural product management. And it just takes a lot of time to change enough of a catchment to make the difference. It's hard enough when you're just talking about grass and crops and trees. When you're talking about changing tarmac and services and infrastructure, then yeah, it's a I think it's a tough job to get the level of intervention. So, so even just understanding how much you would need to change would be a good a good step forward. I'm supposing um, someone's somewhere's looked for you at how much you need to change to make a difference. Um yeah, so we've had Atkins doing surveys and another um, specialist. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's this it's this whole, like, the time to, to, to do it, the time it takes, the time with um, doing it by, via um, the local plan and planning applications. You know, that's you're looking at 30, 40 years to, to make a change in yeah. that, that way. And obviously, let's like say, make, using um, grass, green space, making space for water, well, if you can put four houses on it and get four lots of council tax, we're on to a we've yeah, we're caught to yeah, a rock yeah. and a hard place. Any, well, thank you very much for all your answers. Really helpful. Thank you. Sorry, I can't offer any more any more guidance, Julie. I feel bad. Can't. <laughs> well, no, go go back to the environment agency and say <laughs> there, there's a there's a gap here. We need to be looking at um, you know suburbia. Anyway, thank you very much. Thanks, Julie um, and Chris. There's a few things you might, I'm just going to mention. Firstly, Simple Suds, you've, with Fiala, the booklet that Fiala and Teresa developed on our website, you've got it. Two, uh, drainage and water management plans. This is where water companies basically got fed up with DEFRA and off what not doing things, decided to do water, <laughs> decided to do, um, set something up. And this is almost like, how do we manage water in the urban landscape? And this is so, but water companies, have very different approaches to doing this across the country and Thames Water which is what you are involved with is the least positive on that okay but it's now written into legislation so um, but basically that's how water companies are going to be working with their lead local flood authorities to create these drainage and water management plans over the next couple of years and those will be the vehicle for you actually uh, trying to solve issues. The next one is, and really important, I've got a letter in draft at the moment, is um, the reason why we have so many people on these calls with surface water management problems in urban areas is because we haven't had the investment in the drainage and sewerage systems in our urban areas. Full stop. And the reason for that is twofold. One, because water companies are shareholder um, based, so they want the profit, but more importantly, it's off what has set the rules for water companies through their price review process. And that's firmly fixed on two things. One, price. And the second one is, if you look at their strategies, it's all about water supply. They hardly mention drainage or sewerage or flooding or people, okay? And if you look at uh, the Consumer Council for Water, we've been having meetings with them recently, it's all about water supply. And they're just beginning to get involved with, um, with drainage and so on. So I have a letter at the moment on my laptop draft, being drafted at the moment, which is to the head of Offwat, the interim head of Offwat saying, look, your price review process for 24 needs to take, this is, it needs to change focus completely. Okay. Now, the, la the, with the last price review, um, three companies took off what to the Competition and Marketing Authority because they weren't being allowed to tackle drainage issues, drainage and sewerage issues. Okay. And they got a really positive response. They didn't get everything wanted, but they got a really positive response out of the Competition and Marketing Authority. And so off what has had to agree to set to certain changes for those three water companies, but not others. And so you, you'll begin to see more investment, including in Thames Water, I, I'd have one or two discussions on some of this stuff, but it's really important that we get 
PR24 to actually start to focus on the drainage and sewage requirements over and above just looking at price. Now we can see a symptom of this in that you may have seen in the press, the, the, the focus on water quality and stormwater discharges into particularly chalk streams or other, other streams as well. And that is all a symptom. Although there is a focus on that, that's a symptom of the underinvestment in the drainage and sewerage systems. Because if that water wasn't going into those streams, it'd be going into your house. Right? So what happens is it gets released into storm, into, into rivers, with all the damaging impacts that that has, but it is, you know, etc. But but the constant if the, the consequence of not letting those discharges go into rivers will be that water goes into your house. Right? So we need to tell, we need, you know, we need to, I've got two priorities in my life in terms of policy. One is planning, which you know I've pontificated about too much already. You must be bored and sick and tired of it. And the other one is off what 24. Yeah, it's our PR 24, because that's what needs to change. If we start to get the investment, it will take years, it'll take decades, but if we start to get the investment in infrastructure, then um, that's what's going to help you. Okay. Sorry, I've pumped it. I've, yeah, no, that, that's absolutely fabulous. Thank you very much. Um, although I'm not, I can't, I've tried to take down notes, can't remember all of that. Um, worry, I have actually got a site meeting with um, Thames Water tomorrow because we've got drains where um, the, the, the manhole covers just pop out the ground like tiddlywinks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so we've got, I've got a site, site visit tomorrow. So um, I'll ask them about drainage and water management plans as well. Yeah, I mean, we are hoping to get the, the catchment. Um, assigned as a critical drainage area that might help with the planning yeah uh, but yep. i don't know anyway um thank you sorry everyone for, for taking up the time thank you very much thanks julie any other questions are we there there was there was um i saw in a chat um oh, yeah. carolyn had asked about the protected landscapes and said why just protected landscapes and uh, i wasn't very clear they they these are just kind of interim funds. And the reason the government have got a special fund for protected landscapes is that lots of farmers and landowners in those protected landscapes um, often were recipients of more, they're more reliant on payments from government or from the common agricultural policy as it was, because um, they're often farming on what's called marginal land. So if you imagine, the kind of classic national park farmer they're not they're not in the kind of highly productive um arable growing areas of, of land um they're generally livestock farmers um so the government have created a fund um to help those farmers through this period of uncertainty and transition so in effect it's got nothing um per se, to do with the fact they're protected landscapes. The protected landscape is a proxy for, there are lots of farmers there who are just clinging on because they're farming in this kind of marginal land. Um, there will be other funds that will be being used to help farmers transition from one system to another, and there's lots of changes going on. So I wasn't very clear. It's not that the, the fund is only targeted at protected landscapes. It's that fund is doing a particular job and we've managed to include flood risk reduction as one of the outcomes that can be funded in that area. I hope that's clear, Carolyn. And we had, Leslie, you made a point on the chat as well. Um, I'll just read it out. Most of our farmers' fields are getting ready to be sold to developers, so it is likely to be suds on the developed land, but we have ordinary watercourses running into that land, mostly in mostly uh, with individual riparian ownership and therefore with individual riparian responsibilities. But my guess where you're coming from, Leslie, is that saying because of the developed land, those responsibilities become more important and um, but actually aren't linked to the development. development. Um, so how can you actually change you know, how can you actually for example ensure that people maintain their water courses properly and so on and so forth when in fact they're not linked to 
the development at all. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a problem. It's a huge, huge, huge problem, as you know, because one of the other big issues in, is repair and management in all of its many guises. Um, and work that he isn't on the call today, but the work that Paul Bedford is doing in the Manhood Peninsula is fabulous, absolutely fabulous, um, as a voluntary approach. IDBs are another approach, but there is all of this stuff where we've got, you know, when you've got hundreds of different owners, all with a little pocket of land, all with responsibilities for maintenance no coordination and the possibility of that maintenance going all over the place and causing problems through lack of it or too much of it um yeah we haven't got anywhere near that answer yet yeah but it comes back to the fundamental point that chris mentioned right at the beginning is how do you manage each drop of water as it falls onto the land all the way to the sea or all the way into groundwater yeah i don't have an answer any final questions? What's the score? <laughs> no idea. <laughs> anyway, Chris, thank you all so much. Thank you everybody for uh, participating. Sorry, it wasn't quite so many today, um, but thank you very much for a really interesting, engaging debate. Um, and uh, look forward to the next one. I think we've got one coming up on uh, forecasting. Somebody from Met Office. I'm was trying to get a date out of them today i've got i think well, i mentioned a few uh, other ones i've got planned i will try and be better at sending out dates earlier uh, and preferably with plan as a whole batch of them um but it's a quite a busy time at the moment with all these new projects so thank you everybody thank okay you. Thank, you very thank you thank you very much chris thank take you care, bye. you're welcome bye thanks take care everyone